Uh, I welcome you all to the lecture number 12 of the course title Psychology of Emotion Theory and Applications. So, we are discussing module 5 of this course and module 5 is about positive emotions and happiness. So, this is the third lecture of the module 5. In the first two lecture, uh, we have discussed positive emotions and then we discussed the concept of happiness and subjective well-being part 1. Today, we will be talking about happiness and subjective well-being part 2. So, before we uh, talk about today's lecture, a brief recap of last lecture. In the last lecture, we talked about the concept of happiness and uh, we discussed that happiness could be defined from the various ways it can be defined. But when it comes to the research and the uh, academic discipline like psychology and or positive psychology, happiness has been defined in a very specific way where happiness is technically called as subjective well-being. The word happiness is generally avoided because of too many layman connotation associated with it. So, happiness or subjective well-being is uh, measured in terms of life satisfaction plus emotions, both positive and negative emotions. So, the idea is higher the frequency of positive emotions and uh, higher score in life satisfaction gives more happiness or subjective well-being. So, that is the main uh, the way it is measured in psychology and it is mostly measured using self rating scales where people report their own subjective experiences. Then we have discussed Ruth Winhoven's model of happiness where we discussed the different categories of, of associated with quality of life he proposed and in that context he also talked about life satisfaction is one of the major component where focus should be given for understanding and for policy implication also. because. Uh, according to this model, life satisfaction is associated with whole life. How are you, how do you judge your life as a whole in an enduring way, not just short term today's feeling or next day's feeling, but it is an enduring way in general, how do you feel or kind of judge your life. So, for policy implications and other uh, applied aspects also, the concept of life satisfaction according to this model is very significant. Then we have discussed the concept of effective forecasting where we discuss that we keep on predicting the emotional consequences of events in the future. And many times we make certain errors while predicting the future emotional consequences of future events. And that error particularly uh, is called as impact bias where we typically overestimate the intensity and duration of emotional consequences of certain events in the future. It may be positive events or negative events, we generally overestimate the emotional consequence. So, we make exaggerated, if it is a positive event, we exaggerate the positive emotion associated with certain events in the future. If it is negative, we exaggerate the negativity associated with it in future. And so, we have discussed uh, the various causes behind it in the last lecture. So, today we will be talking about the concept of happiness and how can is it possible to enhance happiness or what factors contribute to happiness in our life through a model called a sustainable happiness model. So, let us see uh, or start today's lecture. So, there is a model proposed by Leibomirsky and her colleagues in 2005 which is called as a sustainable happiness model. Now, this is a model which talks about three major determinants of happiness. So, human happiness what whatever happiness, whatever intensity, whatever duration we experience happiness, these are actually determined by three major factors. And these factors are according to this model, first is called genetic set point, then life circumstances and the third factor is called intentional activities. So, we will see what are these three factors. So, one is genetics, life circumstances that we are uh, kind of find ourselves in and the intentional activities. So, we will see each of them. Now, they also kind of uh, kind of provided certain percentages of contribution of each of these factors in our life. So, some approximate percentages they took from different researches across population and they proposed that uh, that about 50 percent of variance of our happiness in our life, 50 percent of it could be contributed by genetic set point, about 10 percent by life circumstances, 10 percent around by life circumstances and remaining 40 percent could be accounted by 
the different intentional activities that we do in our life. So, they used a pie chart to kind of uh, show this. So, the pie chart somehow looks like this, somewhat look like this. So, so it, here it shows the genetic set point kind of contributes around 50 percent, life circumstances 10 percent, intentional activities 40 percent. These are like approximate indications, uh, exact percentage may not be so strictly determined like this but these are approximate based on some of the research evidences across population they kind of propose this model. <coughs> now, let us see what are this. So, genetic set point means what? So, it basically means lot of things in our life is determined by genes which we get from our parents like the physical body that we get, height of the body, skin color and so on. These are all determined by the genetics that we uh, these are contributed by the genes that we get from our parents. Similarly, lot of our psychological constructs like our the kind of the mood that we experiences, lot of emotional experiences, uh, the personality traits that we all have also largely can could be determined or influenced by genetic set point. So, obviously, in the psychological realm things are more fluctuating, more flexible. So, but uh, still genetics can contribute to that in terms of setting certain boundaries of experiences that we uh, uh, that we can uh, experience in our life. So, this genetics determines lot of things and they kind of cre create a set point, a certain boundaries or limitations around which things can happen not beyond that. So, that is that are determined by the uh, genetics. So, these are generally fixed stable over time and immune to the influence of control. So, generally these are fixed because these are kind of given influence very deeply from within us. Uh, generally, they are very stable factors. So, if something is determined by gene, it is not easy to change because this is, these are influenced by very deeper factors, biological factors. So, in that sense, it is, these are kind of set points. Now, how do we know that there are some genetic set point for something like em emotions and happiness and so on? A lot of these evidences actually comes from uh, twin studies. Now, twin studies, uh, there are two types of twins. Uh, I think twins could be uh, identical or non-identical. So, identical twins are exactly same in terms of genetic composition. So, identical twins are 100 percent same in genetic composition. So, these are those twins who, who looks exactly same. So, outsider people cannot distinguish who is who or differentiate between who is who because they look exactly same. So, these uh, biologically they are very same in terms of genetic composition 100 percent same gene composition. And non-identical twins, they look different, but they are still identical. So, around 50 percent genes are shared by them. So, a lot of these studies who studied identical twins uh, and uh, if though they show certain traits, if it is very similar. So, one of the conclusion that we can make that it is contributed by the gene. However, the problem is if both the twins remain in the same environment, then it could be contributed by the environment also. So, a lot of these studies actually found out twins who are separated after birth and they were reared in a different circumstances or different environments in the different families. Either one was adopted by another family or separated for some reason. So, a lot of these studies which shows identical twins who were reared in the different environment or different families, even they show dramatically very similar traits, personality characteristics or in terms of their emotional experiences. Uh, so, a lot of these studies actually indicated that gene could contribute very strongly to our emotional experiences, our personality traits. Uh, so, in that sense, th th these are some of the evidences that we got from the uh, twin studies. So, genes can contribute a lot to our emotional experiences including positive emotions and happiness. <coughs> so, to what extent gene contributes? Obviously, uh, different studies show different percentage. Lump sum most of the studies generally shows the coefficient could be approximate 50 percent variance. 
So, it is still not 100 percent determined by, but uh, it is around 50 percent. Some study shows it is more than that, some study shows it is little less than that. So, it could be somewhere approximate 50 percent contribution could be, um, but some traits it could be much more, some traits it could be less. So, the genetic contribution is not same for every aspect. Uh, so, it could be uh, for happiness and other thing, generally it could be around 50 percent contribution we can say from the genetics or uh, it, co it comes from the genetics. So, the next factor is called life circumstances. Now, life circumstances are some things which are uh, generally stable element of a of our life which are incidental, but relatively stable facts of our life. So, circumstances basically means lot of things we are given after birth you know we get it it is an incidental you have not uh, no you d we do not choose them they are just you know comes with our birth lot of circumstances and lot of other circumstances happen you know as we progress in our life most of the circumstances are like stable incidental factors in our life generally they are stable they life circumstances do not change very often some of this can change obviously but they do they change change every day like your circumstances will change so lot of life circumstances uh, could contribute to your happiness like happiness relevant relevant life circumstances may include uh, national geographic cultural region of residence where you reside what kind of geographic location national location cultural region uh, it also includes demographic factors such as your age, your gender, ethnicity. So, these are lot of these things you get gender, ethnicity, we get it from our birth and these are like stable things, you know, you cannot change them uh, generally. So, individual personal history also can come under life circumstances such as your experience of past trauma, accidents, whatever events that have happened and that have lot of traumatic impact on you like accidents and traumatic experiences. So, these are all also kind of facts of your life. Life status variable such as your marital status, income, health, religious affiliation, etcetera also comes under life circumstances. So, if you see lot of these factors actually they are very incidental and they are very stable also. You cannot keep changing them overnight or every day. So, these are like stable facts of our life, but incidental. So, these are all life circumstances. A lot of these life circumstances contribute to your happiness. Some circumstances can decrease happiness, some circumstances can increase happiness. Uh, some of these things are here. Some of the research show the circumstances which are most consistently associated with subjective well being or happiness, which kind of predicts higher subjective well being or happiness, uh, like being married. Some of the research in the a lot of this western culture in the cultural context short being married uh, generally increases happiness for so there can be exceptions only thing is that these are like population level studies which shows indicates that people who are married generally express or kind of reports higher happiness or subjective well being being religious also especially people who do certain practices which kind of contributes their peace and happiness that also can increase being employed obviously is a very important factors as compared to people who are unemployed employment gives a lot of happiness being healthy obviously is also very commonsensical health is the most important factors that contribute to your happiness also sufficiently wealthy to meet basic needs so wealth especially at least this amount of wealth should be this much that it you no know, it kind of meets your basic needs of your life beyond that there are other things which may not be the relationship may not be very like direct or linear like as your money increases your happiness may not increase proportionately you no know, like a linear relationship it's not like that but at least wealth is important for happiness to the extent that it it helps you to meet your basic needs of your life so these are some of the circumstances where research shows that these are related to higher subjective well being now one, one of the interesting thing is that lot of these studies shows that all these circumstances combined they do not really contribute very high percentages of one's happiness in life. So, percentages could kind of vary from 8 to 15 percent. So, if you see genetics somewhere around 50 percent. Now, here the percentages and the population level most of the study shows it varies from 8 to 15 percent. So, life circumstances do not really contribute much. It is kind of counterintuitive because we believe that 
changing our life circumstances will enhance our happiness level but the research don't show that they really contribute much to our happiness what could be the reason so this is a kind of paradoxical finding and uh, generally we assume happiness depends on our life circumstances so what could be the reason one of the reason is that people get adapted or hedonic adaptation is a term that is uh, given where when there is a, some things which are very constant in our life we generally get adapted to them when something loses their novelty uh, we kind of in get influence for some time then we get adapted to them so a lot of these life circumstances are very stable facts of our life these are like you cannot change a lot of these life circumstances so we get adapted to them they no longer kind of kind of uh, you know uh, makes you disturb all the time because it is already there and you kind of learn to de uh, no, deal with them so that is what is called as an hedonically adapted we no longer you know it gives you that emotional changes because we keep ad adaptive them and if something is very constant they don't have much emotional values in terms of affecting us so people seems to very rapidly adapt to life circumstances for example let's say your income increases obviously people will be very happy they will experience lot of positive emotions but for how long you will be happy with that rise of income for few days then you get adapted to this rise of income now it becomes a normal of your normal of normal aspect of your life that increase income after few days it will not give you that kind of kick or happiness that is that is to give when you for, for initially you experience that so you basically you get adapted to this rise of income or higher income status so you it it will not give happiness for a long time no for sometimes it will be give then you will get adapted to them because this rise high level of income will become normal for you so that is called an adaptation so people generally get adapted to most of this life circumstances because these are kind of constant facts so that is why uh, they may not really contribute much because even if they change again we get adapted to them so an adaptation is one of the kind of problems you can say one of the hindrance for happiness for sustainable happiness now both genetic set point and life circumstances are largely not in our control genetics obviously it is not in our control it came from so many generation to generation and it passed on to us and how it is influencing a lot of these things we don't have much control over it life circumstances also most of them we don't have much control because these are incidental facts of life and they are very stable facts of life but the third factors they said which is connected to the happiness is called intentional activities these are the active part only where we have control over it so this is the last component that is intentional activities which according to them contributes around 40% and has lot of avenues for pursuit of happiness now what are these intentional activities now these intentional activities are basically effortful actions whatever actions that we do in our life or practices that we do which include all the varieties of things that we do intentionally or with effort intentional means effortful or people choose to engage so these are not automatically given to you in life we have to do and choose and so many things we have to do so these are all called intentional activities uh, now all all these all activities that we do intentionally also influences our happiness now some intentional activities may make you sad some intentional activities may enhance your happiness so this can contribute a lot so intentional activities does not happen by itself you have to put effort so whatever effortful action this that we do are called as intentional activities L life circumstances generally happens to you you find yourself in certain circumstances and intentional activities are ways you act on those circumstances life circumstances happen to people and intentional activities are ways that people act on their circumstances how do you deal them or how do you kind of put effort to make better and so on so those will be kind of counted under intentional activities so this intentional activities are more controllable because we do it with our effort intentionally we choose to do them so therefore we can control them whether to continue some activity or not to do or whether to change an activity so all these things is these are in our conscious control so if this activities influences our happiness so the one good news is that you know, this is the part where we can have lot of interventions where we can kind of uh, 
consciously change them to influence our happiness. So, this also gives the greatest potential for sustainable increase in happiness. Other two factors are not much in our control, they can influence no doubt, but we cannot do much about them. But here we can do everything about these factors because it is in our control, total control. So, intentional activities could be of varieties of type of activities, whatever different activities that we do which requires cho choice, effort and so on. So, Leibomirsky proposed three categories of intentional activities. One is called as behavioral activities which reflect person actions such as physical activities. Uh, it could include like uh, something like meditation, mindfulness, social activities such as doing acts of kindness or gratitude. Now, a lot of this can have a mental component also, but physical component also or physical exercise or so on. All these activities have been found to increase happiness or subjective well-being. So, this the certain actions that we do where you know certain movement and actions are required. So, these are called behavioral activities like you we do physical activity, exercise and so on. You need effort to do it. You need to choose okay, I will do exercise today. Now, so, this is an intentional activity or if you sit in your room automatically exercise will not happen, you have to put effort and do it. So, that is why it is an intentional activity, but it is more action oriented activity. So, it is it will come under behavioral activity, uh, some meditational activity also requires some physical actions. It also includes mental aspects where you can do lot of social activities like you know doing acts of kindness where helping people and so on. Uh, can also enhance happiness and so on. Next is cognitive activity means uh, these are activities which are purely mental activities like it need not necessarily uh, you have to go outside and do some actions, but these are mostly related to your thought processes and attitudes and so on. So, cognitive activity includes persons attitudes such as cultivating uh, gratitude, forgiveness, cognitive approaches to coping with adversity all this can increase uh, happiness or subjective well-being. So, at the mental level for example, you change your thought process from negative to positive or you forgive somebody intentionally, consciously you say I forgive somebody. So, it needs some effort, but it is totally mental effort. So, or, or you change your thought, now you are thinking very pessimistic about your future, now you suddenly think there is an optimistic, you think that some positive thing can also happen. So, you shift your perspective. So, it needs some effort in terms of looking at things and changing it. So, these are all cognitive activities. All these uh, some many of these cognitive activities are associated with higher subjective well-being. Third category is called volitional activities. This includes motivational and goal oriented activities that we do. The kind of goal that we uh, set for ourselves can also enhance your happiness. We have so many goals in our life and we try to achieve those goals and uh, we need motivation to fulfill them. So, these are all called volitional activities and uh, research shows that the goals which are concordant with one's values and interest. So, if you set goals which are kind of in sync with our own values and interest, if we, if we have set some goals which is what we like to achieve them, we are really interested in doing those kind of activities and to achieve certain goals and these are in concordance with our own value system. Then those achievement of those goals can also enhance lot of happiness. So, obviously, all this needs intentional activities. So, uh, so uh, intentional activities could be pure mental activities or physical activities or goal oriented activities. So, most of these activities whatever do will come under one of these th categories. Now, this model had some criticism also in the sense especially the percentages they talked about. Some researcher also criticized this model in terms of not the determinant aspect, but most of the percentage aspect. For example, Brown and uh, Rohrer uh, uh, wrote an article where they kind of criticize some aspect of this model, where they say this model basically confuse uh, mix between mixed the mix uh, between subject variance with within subject variance means lot of these percentages that are taken these are kind of across population they were found. So, these are between uh, percentage between subjects not within one subject you know so many people in the population have been studied and these percentages were found and the variance like 10 percent uh, for life circumstances. It is not for one individual if you look all the life circumstances and 10 percent, but studying different people in the population 
ten percent and those fifty percent uh, those percentages came up and they kind of took those between subject and kind of calculated as a within sub within person percentage so which could which may be may not be correct in many circum many you know context like 10 percent of a person variance in happiness can be explained by that of a person's life circumstances as is unless established within subject level analysis so a lot of these studies they did between subject variances in the population cross sectional studies and uh, they kind of made it analyzed it in the within subject category which may be uh, may not be correct in some circumstances so this is one criticism another is that all these factors were considered as an independent factor like genetic is a different factor uh, you know uh, life circumstances a different factor and uh, intentional activity is a different factor but in real life lot of these factors could be interconnected for example genetic factors may interact with circumstances and the intentional activities to influence our happiness so they may also kind of share each others and contribute to each other again this lot of the sources of percentage were taken from different sources not from one study so that also may not be correct in showing now but having said that uh, the proposer of this model ibomisky and sheldon and other they kind of already indicated that this aspect in their model where they said these are like indicative and approximate percentages which were indicated by different studies so these percentages may be kind of fluctuate but these are kind of indications that they got from different studies and they are showing and lot of research shows that these factors contribute to our happiness so there is no doubt in that aspect that these are important factors that contribute to our happiness uh, so this basic idea of this model is correct and is supported by lot of evidences okay so this basic idea that it is possible for people to influence their own happiness by intentional activity this is something evidence based and lot of evidences are there so that is the take home message that it is possible to change our happiness particularly using intentional activities so that's the important message that is uh, that is correct there is no controversy around it so it is clear that our happiness is not completely determined by genetics or life circumstances there is a lot of scope beyond them to even influence it and it fluctuates from time to time and we all know our happiness fluctuates from time to time it is not fixed thing it's very dynamic thing so our volitional or intentional activities are the log logical source of influence of this fluctuation for happiness level this fluctuation could be explained by using our intentional activities so that is the most important thing or take away message from this model now the most important question that uh, naturally then comes up is that how can you use this intentional activity for increasing happiness how can we use that so that's the message we got but how to use them so if happiness is rooted in, uh, rooted in our intentional activities what activities should we do what kind of activities should everybody do the same thing or a lot of other activities should be done so according to libomirsky uh, for the best result one need to do this person activity fitness so this is very important the match between the person and the activity so everybody may not be benefited by same kind of activity people prefer to do different kinds of activities so there has to be match between person and the activity so there has to be match between person and the activity so that is something very important so in terms of understanding intentional activities so person activity fitness basically means any one particular activity may not be suitable for all persons people have different strengths values and interests according to those strengths values and interests one will be predisposed to benefit from some activities according to their values and interest people may like to do some activity some other people will like to do some other activities and accordingly it will influence their happiness for example people who are very extroverts very outgoing social kind of people they will benefit from activities that are related to other people or come to some kind of social activity or activity that requires interaction with other people they will benefit more because their tendency is to connect with people 
for example other people who are very introverted they they prefer to live in their own world they may uh, benefit from other kind of activities which need which does not require inter interaction with other people so it could be something like you know doing meditations or something like that where there is no need to connect with other people so depending on the nature of individual one can choose based on their interest based on their values based on their strengths people can uh, find out uh, what activities they prefer and gives them more happiness so how to do this person activity some indi uh, some indications are there some indicators are there which can be used by everybody to do do this person activity fit one is that you know one need to understand act fit activities with the source of one's happiness so if somebody is unhappy for some reasons that something is creating lot of unhappiness in one's life find out the source of unhappiness and do ac actions accordingly so that will reduce remove the source of unhappiness so one need to identify the source of unhappiness and by removing that source will increase the happiness so to do this fitness one need to find out the source of unhappiness and then accordingly activities can follow so if people may be unhappy for a variety of reasons everybody has their own reasons uh, find out the source of unhappiness and match it with the right activity which can remove that source for example a pessimist may benefit from cultivating optimism or optimistic thoughts sometimes people are unhappy because they keep on because one of the uh, main reason is that they think too much of pessimistic thoughts too much of negative thoughts so the source is pessimism so one need to address that how to address that so do cognitive activity or at least change or shift your thought process towards more optimism so that will uh, kind of remove the source and it will uh, enhance your happiness level fit with your strength so that is another important uh, criteria to kind of fit fit with it person activity uh, fitness also can be done by identifying strength and talents for example a creative person may express love gratitude through painting or writing so activities which is in sync with your strengths it is we always prefer to do things which we are best in doing it so if we if we have some strength generally we love to do those kind of things because we know how to do them if you if we don't know how to do some actions or we don't have much understanding then we prefer to avoid them because we are not good at it so if we have some strength and we are good at something it is better to use or activities in sync with that strength because we will feel happy in expressing that if somebody has a creativity in terms of painting let's say so if they express their life through those painting they will feel much more happier because painting is their strength as compared to someone who doesn't know how to paint for other person other strength should be there so like that fitting with your strength is one of the ways one can find out what activities should be done the third important thing is that fitting with your lifestyle sometimes one can fit certain or find activities but it may not be suitable for one's lifestyle because everybody has different lifestyle in different times for doing activities uh, so choosing activities that can be adapted to fit with one's lifestyle for example if you have a hectic lifestyle one can choose activities which can be done in a very short duration if someone has a lifestyle which are very different and uh, let's say somebody has a spiritual person one can choose activities which are in sync with spirituality like meditation and so on so like that one can do this kind of uh, actions to fit with their lifestyle strengths and sources of unhappiness to do person activity fitness now overall in psych positive psychology we call something as positive activity interventions which basically means these are intentional activities which enhances happiness are called positive activities so not all activities will enhance your happiness so those activities which enhances your happiness or subjective well being are called as positive intentional activities or positive activities so these are activities which are simple intentional regular practices it mimics lot of these activities mimics the healthy thoughts and behavior associated with naturally happy people so people who are naturally very happy most of the time uh, some people are very happy they express more happiness so some of these activities mimics the mindset of those people why some people are naturally happy because uh, they have certain mindsets one can mimic those mindset using positive activities uh, like 
things like expressing gratitude, optimistic thinking, pro-social behavior and so on. So, this all this which enhances happiness are called as positive activities. So, research shows varieties of positive intentional activities which are at least found some evidence uh, in terms of their effectiveness in increasing well-being and reduce negative symptoms in various uh, randomized control studies like writing letters of gratitude or expressing gratitude is one of the significant exercise or intentional activity. So, gratitude is basically uh, I, I think we have already mentioned is that you know expressing gratitude basically means expressing thankfulness towards other individual who contributes to your life or in or whatever things that you get in life or in general you are thankful about what life has given to you. So, basically it is about shifting your thoughts from complaining aspects to more aspects where you can be grateful. So, complaining and gratitude cannot exist together because these are opposite things. When you are complaining in life, you are seeing the problems of life or the defects of life or issues that you face in your life. When you show gratitude, you are looking at things which are good in your life. So, everybody has so many positive things in their life. Generally, we do not look at them. Natural tendency of mind is to find out things which are not good or something to complain about. It is a natural tendency of human mind. So, this shifting this tendency requires intention. So, people can do lot of exercises like you know, uh, if somebody has done something good in your life, you can write letters of gratitude. So, so many actual, actual experiments shows they can immediately enhance your happiness or you can do this exercise just remembering things uh, or speculating or kind of reflecting on things which are good in one's life in terms of skills that you have, in terms of uh, material things that you got in life or relationships that you got. So, many ways of doing it are there. So, all these exercises uh, research have found that increases happiness and so on. Counting one blessing is again connected to gratitude only. You simply find out the things for which you are blessed in your life. So, if you find try to find out everybody will find out something even if you think your life is highly miserable. No one's life is 100 percent miserable there will be something obviously where one can feel blessed about some aspect of their life. Again practicing optimism is more about shifting things more specifically for the future aspect of your life. One can be optimistic because it, it changes your emotion from negative to positive and it helps you to you know function better to bring about positive changes in your life. Another thing is very important which is called acts of kindness. Research have very clearly shown when people help other people or show at least some kind of kindness doing small small activities also immediately it makes them lot of you know it makes them very happy. So, it need not be doing some great charity work or something even if you smile at somebody specially you know somebody is in the dejected or sad or just to enhance their motivation you smile at them it can be a can be counted under acts of kindness because your intention is to help someone or let us say in a transport you give is a seat public transport you give your seat to someone who is more needy like older person. So, that can be also act counted as an act of kindness. So, that your intention is to help someone. So, immediately it gives you happiness because what you give it comes back to you. So, you give happiness to someone automatically it comes back to you and we all experience this act of kindness makes people immediately happy. So, that is why probably lot of people still do lot of acts of kindness. One primary reason is that it makes them happy. Using one's strength in a new ways. So, using strength we all have different strengths it need not be strength only in terms of mental capability. One may have strength of creativity, one may have strength of let us say empathy or understanding other people or one may have a strength of courage. There can be different kinds of strength that we all have not necessarily only ability of mental ability or something like that. So, the more we use that strength that we all have the more happier we become because if something is strength means you are good at it and it once it is expressed expression of that strength enhances happiness because we feel good when we express something which we like or which we are good at it. So, or basically our interest is much more on things where our strength is there we do not like to do where there is a weakness, we do not know how to do something then obviously, we will try to avoid them. We like to do things, we are more interested in doing things where strengths are there. 
So, using one strength more and more and in newer ways is always uh, enhances happiness. So, this is also a kind of research finding. Affirming one's important or uh, values. So, if you have certain important values, affirming it and working towards it also enhances happiness. Different kinds of meditation and mindfulness activities are also found to be very important in enhancing one happiness. So, these are some of the activities. Uh, we cannot go very detail about each of them. Each of them will require one lecture, but the focus is more on understanding happiness and subjective well being in more broader aspects. So, uh, that is why we have just discussed some of the activities in a very brief uh, brief way so that we understand that lot of activities can be done which enhances happiness level so all these uh, positive activities or exercises works how how they impact us positively or enhances happiness the mechanism is that is they promote positive feelings whatever you do let's say you exercise gratitude the moment you become grateful for something you feel happy because you are looking at positive side of it the moment you complain about something you feel sad automatically it immediately it shifts your experiences. So, it enhance it promotes positive feeling all these activities positive thoughts like gratitude I said it enhances your positive thoughts and positive behaviors. So, if your thoughts are positive automatically behavior will also be positive. So, these activities do not focus on your fixing negative things or pathological feelings. So, not at all focusing on anything negative. So, we have already discussed in the positive emotion lecture that positive emotions automatically undoes the impact of negative. So, if you have lot of negative emotions in you, these activities are not directly addressing any of these things. These may be there, you just stimulate positive emotions, automatically the negative emotions aspects will be, will diminish and uh, there is no need to fix them separately, no, automatically it will be fixed. A meta analysis of about 51 randomized controlled intervention studies, all these studies that focused on interventions or how these activities enhances happiness, that is the meaning of interventions, found that people who engage in all these positive activities, such as thinking gratefully, optimistically, or mindfully, become significantly happier. Uh, so, these are like 51 studies shows similar direction of findings. So, it is not just one study or two study, you know. So, it is a meta analysis of many studies which did similar studies uh, and their findings are also in the same direction. So, with this I will stop here uh, and uh, uh, with this, this module also ends and in the next module we will be talking about some other aspects of emotions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.